are doing our poster shoot for The Way We Get By, a new Neil LeBute show, playing at Second Stage in May. The Way We Get By is a story of two people who are experiencing that worldwide phenomenon of the morning after, of having slept together, uh, made a decision in a drunken state. And it's really a real-time play that deals with the kind of 90 minutes after they both wake up and make that first move towards staying together or, or pulling apart from each other. My character in this place is Beth. Works, has a normal life, but she's kind of dealing with these feelings that she has for this man. Doug had some trouble growing up, had some trouble maturing, but I think that he's a guy who is capable of this really intensely idealized romantic love. It's a story about people trying to figure out who they are to each other and who they are together and should they be together and I think these are questions that we all want answers to and that we're all looking for. Sometimes it comes down to how, you know, we want to be perceived by the people we love. So it's interesting, there's a twist. There's some taboos here. There are things that will keep them apart that, that not everyone has to face. It's really for anybody who's ever had um, a challenge in their relationship, a challenge of, you know, how will the rest of the world see us? And what's it like to come back to second stage? It's like coming home. And this is the place where I started my career. It's a safe, artistic home for me. I'm Amanda Seyfried. I'm starring in The Way We Get By by Neil Butte this spring. I'm Thomas Sadowski. I am starring in The Way We Get By at second stage. Let's jump right in and introduce our panel this evening. Uh, first, uh, an award-winning production designer and set designer of theater, film, television, opera, and dance. Neil Patel's recent works include the New York premieres of The Lion, Pretty Filthy, Indian Ink, Mr. Burns, A Post-Electric Play, Stage Kiss, Father Comes Home from the Wars, and the feature films Some Velvet Morning and Loitering with Intent, as well as the recent Neil LeBute television series Billy and Billy. His many design credits also include Sideman on Broadway, The West End, and the Kennedy Center, the original musical title of show on Broadway, and Dinner with Friends in New York and on national tour. He has twice been recognized with an Obie Award for Sustained Excellence and has been the recipient of the Helen Hayes Award and numerous Henry Hughes and Drama Desk nominations. Neil Patel. A two-time Obie Award winner, Lee Silverman helmed the lauded Broadway productions of David Henry Wong's Chinglish and Lisa Crone's Well, and was nominated last year for a Tony Award for her direction of the acclaimed Broadway revival of the musical Violet at Roundabout Theatre Company. Uh, her resume boasts more than 30 off-Broadway and regional world premiere productions, including most recently, David Greenspan's I'm Looking for Helen, Twelve Trees, Bess Wall's American Hero, David Henry Wong's Kung Fu, and Yellow Face, which was a 2007 Pulitzer finalist, and Madeline George's The Curious Case of the Watson Intelligence, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist last season. Lee's work has been seen all over New York, Playwrights Horizons, Manhattan Theatre Club, the Public, MCC, New York Theatre Workshop, as well as Williamstown, the Huntington, ACT, the Goodman, and the Guthrie Theatres. Please welcome Lee Silverman. Hi. And last but certainly not least, Neil LeBute is one of America's most prolific, heralded, and controversial contemporary voices of stage and screen big and small. His plays include Bash, The Mercy Seat, Shape of Things, The Distance from Here, The Money Shot, Reasons to be Happy, In a Dark, Dark House, Fat Pig, Audubon, This is How It Goes, and the Tony-nominated Reasons to be Pretty. He has written and directed for television with 10 by 10, Full Circle, and Billy and Billy. He is also an acclaimed filmmaker known for In the Company of Men, Your Friends and Neighbors, Some Velvet Morning, and most recently, Dirty Weekend, which premiered at this year's Tribeca Film Festival. Please welcome Neil LeBute. So let's, uh, let's begin at the beginning. Um, Neil, maybe you can talk a little bit about where this play came from. Uh, where did it start for you? Um, it's, I guess it started with the title. It started with... Um, a title that I'd had around for a little while. In fact, for, um, I don't know if you knew this, 
but it was um, an original title for Reasons to Be Pretty. And um, originally my agent said, I can't keep that straight with other titles that you have, so get rid of it. <laughs> um, and for some reason I listened to my agent for <laughs> once and changed it. And, and I think a better title for that play came yeah. to be, Reasons to Be yes. Pretty. Um, and this particular play went through a couple of iterations of titles and ultimately I landed back on the way we get by and just told my agent to be quiet. Um, <laughs> which she duly did, which was thoughtful. Um, <laughs> took 10% of that, but, that idea, but um, stayed quiet. Um, and so that was, the, the title was there, um, and it wasn't necessarily the, the, the nucleus of this, but um, I've always liked uh, both as a viewer and as a practitioner, I guess, um, putting actors into a real-time situation, putting especially a two-hander, two actors on stage in the time uh, shared with an audience that is actually happening in their lives. So this is a play about the 90 minutes of, uh, I think if you if you were watching um, that, that little piece a moment ago, um, I mentioned that it's a, you know, this little combustible moment where, um, where two people find themselves at a crossroads. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, was, I was intrigued with writing a kind of morning after play about you know, how we make those choices about moving on or, or retreating. And, uh, and I guess ultimately doing something about bravery, mm -hmm. I guess. Was it always two people in your mind? Did you always know that? Yes, two people Just with, two. with two people with a um, a kind of overhanging, overreaching third character mm -hmm. who's never there. If you come we'll, to the we'll show, we'll talk more about her in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you'll see. There's a there's someone who's not in the room, uh, who's who's kind of always in the room. Mm -hmm. But whose apartment it is? Yes, yes. 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 We'll we'll get into the apartment uh, uh, in a, later on. Um, Lee, uh, yes. how did you first become involved with this production? And um, I know Neil's sitting here, but what is it like working with Neil for the first time? This may be filtered through Neil, uh, don't listen. the circumstances. <laughs> no, Plug <please>. your ears. <laughs> um, well, I had done a play with Tommy Sadowski 10 years ago, and he and I had been trying to find another project to do together. And he called me last summer and said that he was working with Neil again on another um, play at Second Stage. And I was an enormous fan of the last play that he did with Neil, which was Reasons to be Pretty, which he did with Marin. I've heard of it. I've heard about and it. What? I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might know about <laughs> it. Um, which was incredible um, for anyone who didn't see it. it was um, I saw it both off-Broadway and also on Broadway and um, a number of times, actually. And it was, I think nobody writes like Neil writes. He captures the way that people really talk in a way that is um, both feels so truthful and so honest and also a little shocking and also um, s sort of human, surprisingly human. And so um, Tommy a asked me to read this play and, um, and I really fell in love with it m because what this play asks is for these two characters, as Neil said, to be on stage in real time um, trying to figure out who's gonna kind of say the truth first. And that felt really interesting to me because that's like an emotional game of chicken, right? Like that's like who's gonna put their foot in the water first and be brave enough to keep their foot in the water and then put the other foot in. And so the whole play is kind of circling on this axis of am I gonna be brave enough to first of all say my feelings Second of all, let the other person say their feelings and then deal with the aftermath of that. And I got very excited about all of that and um, have, have just enjoyed the collaboration so much because Neil is a master and um, I work with a lot of playwrights and it is a great, great privilege to work with someone who is so smart and sharp and clear about the kind of story that he wants to tell and has such vision. So. For me, it's been a, it's been kind of a dream, actually. Um, can you speak at all about uh, your approach to, uh, you know, like, as you were just saying, you've worked with a lot of different playwrights who um, work uh, in many different styles, I guess you might say, many different kind of uh, uh, writing styles. I'm thinking specifically of David Greenspan and Madeline George, as well as Neil, and they're so different. Does your approach change based on the material as a director, or? Do you find that you kind of just start with the basic questions every time? Um, 
That's a great question. I feel like every process is so unique based on the needs of both the actors and the writer and also figuring out there's this thing about when you're making a play, particularly when it's a new play, where because you don't know necessarily where you're going to end up and every day there's rewrites and every day we're like, oh, this part would be better if it actually happened over here and we got this piece of information here and there's this weird, like you're kind of groping around in the dark all the time and it's, it's um, exciting but it can be really terrifying and tense and I think particularly if you're working with collaborators where there's not trust and there's not respect, that process can be brutal and I think what you hope for is that you get a group of people in the room who are super game and very enthusiastic and that you figure out, as, as the director, I feel like it's my job to get everybody on the same page so that everybody wants to be in the same play and is telling the same story. And although that, that seems sort of obvious, it's actually one of the hardest things about what I do. And um, so different writers have different approaches to some people, some writers love to be in rehearsal, some writers hate to be in rehearsal, some writers hate to rewrite, some writers like to just rewrite once it gets in front of an audience for the first time, some writers like to do all the work in the room and then never come to see the show. I mean, it's like, I've seen it all. Um, but there's really like, I, I think what, one of the things that I really love about working with Neil is that he, um, even though he works in all kinds of mediums, he actually is, is a great m man of the theater and as someone who's trying to execute his vision, it is a great, um, it, it makes for a much better collaboration. I think that communication between writers and directors on new plays, the first time working together, it could be, it could be rough. <laughs> Could. It could. Sure. It hasn't been. It's been kind of great. <laughs> it's been so, great. Yeah. It's been really, really great. Why do they need to be super gay? What? <laughs> Is that what you said? Game. 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 <laughs> mm. I mean, super gay, I guess, isn't it? Gay, gay, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, whatever. Nice, too. <laughs> Don't get me to wrong. Each his own. To each his own. Absolutely fine. I just, yeah. I just wanted Game. to know why. I just, Game. Yeah. I hadn't yeah. heard that theory, and so yeah. I was... <laughs> no. I was curious. So I don't know where you've been, yeah. Neil. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, it's yeah. true. Um, but Neil, I should have no, picked you, it up by now. Yeah, right. You have directed your own work a yeah. lot, and um, sometimes you let other people do it. Mm. And what, when you're working with someone else as a director, when can you speak a little bit to when you kind of step in? When do you, ha you know, having been in that position before? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a little bit of um, a dance, because you, you know, with like dancing itself, um, you know the idea, the basic idea about each person would be a different partner. And um, I think I'm relatively good. Feel free to jump in. Um, Please do. I think I'm, I'm quite good at the delineation of, of job in, in, in that situation where having directed and worked um, probably less with other writers. I've, I've mostly in the theater directed my own stuff. People can box you in and say, this is what you do. And so I certainly get asked less to direct other people's work. Um, and I try to remain unoffended. Um, but I do, uh, probably as much as I've directed my own, I've had other people direct. And it's been quite successful, certainly in this case, but, but almost across the board. Um, a couple of blips. Um, uh, I'll tell you upstairs <laughs> when the microphone's off. Um, but I, I think it's you know really important to to understand that it's that it's uh, uh, you know a, a work that you've created. It's a blueprint, and to buy into this idea that you you know you have someone directing it. It's their interpretation of it, and so um, it's not so cut and dried as uh, you know I only whisper to Lee if I have a something to say and I don't talk to the cast. You can get into strange combinations of oh, I've directed that person before you have, and mm -hmm. I once directed you, or I've written for you, and, and so it's a, it's a strange cross-pollinization of, of, of craft a lot of the time. Um, but I think it's been, it's been very clear and, and easy in this particular case, but I, I, again, I think I'm pretty good at saying, in this one, I'm the writer. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think like a writer. I tend not to think about you know, the big picture or even the picture so much as what I've written and um, am looking to strengthen the text. Um, if I have a thought about anything, you know, we've usually talked about it. And I think that you know, Lee has had as many thoughts about the text as, as anything else you know, in, uh, in, on display on, on the stage. Um, 
and I think it's, it's, it's very much kind of a may the best idea win. Mm. You know, seems to be the best rehearsal processes I've had have been this respect for everybody's ego and everybody's uh, collaboration. And um, you can walk out, you know, you can, you can have differences of opinions, you can, you can lose this little battle. And, and I don't think of them, I guess, even as battles, really, mm -hmm. you know, or in the best way, you know, a battle in the courtroom where lawyers miraculously can eat with each other after, you know, berating each other, <laughs> that kind of thing. It, it, there is a little bit of that, that, you know, you, you really have to let it wash off you and say, this is all for the good of a cause that we're working on. It's as long as you keep remembering that it's our show, you know, that we're all working together for this thing. Um, I, I think it's, a, it's actually a relatively simple process that occasionally gets blown out of proportion mm -hmm. by, by the wrong things. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, I think that uh, it would be a great moment to hear our first excerpt. Um, I would like to welcome two of the stars of Neil's film, Dirty Weekend, which, as we mentioned before, recently debuted at Tribeca Film Festival. who will be reading the roles of Doug and Beth this evening, um, Phil Burke and Gia Crovatin. Um, Neil, can you set up this first I, scene? I can, yeah. Us? This is actually the first uh, excerpt that you'll hear is um, from the beginning of the play. Um, it's, it's really as, as the curtains close and, and the lights drop, uh, we find an apartment in New York um, pretty quickly on. A young man uh, walks into the living room, um, not wearing much, and, um, and settles in to, uh, to grab a bottle of water, turn on the television quietly, and uh, pretty quickly a young woman comes out, um, and we realize that uh, this is a, a kind of morning after where the two of them have been at a uh, wedding um, vow renewal not just a wedding reception, but a vow renewal, um, and uh, have gotten drunk and ended up together at her apartment that she shares with a young woman named Kim. Um, so I would, uh, I would love to involve uh, the other Neil into this conversation. Um, can you talk a little bit about the world of this play and how you started to create this space for these characters? Yeah. The, um as you learned from the excerpt that was just read, the, yeah. there's this third character in the play, which is Kim, whose apartment it is. So I had the kind of unusual job of designing a set that's really the manifest, the character of this character we never meet, but we learn lots of things about during the course of the play. So the photograph you see there is a model that I made that just kind of shows the basic structure of the set. And the things we know about Kim are that she's extremely orderly and controlling to a point of almost um, pathological nature. So um, the, we built this idea of Kim starting with where the apartment is. So I imagined it was an older building that's been renovated. And we come up with the basic structure and then we fill in all the details. That's what you can't actually see in the model is all the detail of her organizing the space. And this is something that's kind of oppressive at, to Beth and something that she talks about throughout the play, how it, it's, it's completely controlling her behavior, even to the point where the gifts given to her are to fit in with the decor that Kim's chosen for this place. Mm -hmm. So um, we also, when you, in, the, in the creation of her character and the props, a lot of that happened in, um, a lot of the big decisions were made before tech, but a lot of those decisions actually we just made last week when we were in tech, because we really learn once we see the actors in the space, how they interact with things. We give them physical opportunities in the space, but we also refine the character. Um, for instance, we found the orderliness of it became almost masculine. It didn't really represent the, um, Kim the way we wanted. So we, we, by introducing color and detail into the, into the design and the dressing, we kind of arrived at what we thought was our Kim or our imagined Kim character. I, lo I love thinking about Kim so much. <laughs> when I saw it, I've, I really got such a clear uh, idea of her. Um, I would throw this to anybody else too, how, how did kind of Kim <laughs> evolve? I feel like she's also monopolizing this entire uh, panel tonight, which is fitting, I think. Yeah. I mean, we can't stop talking about Kim from the beginning. Um, but if anybody else, you know, throw in how, how she kind of emerged 
Yeah. Well, we talked about Kim a lot in rehearsal, <laughs> and um, she's it's very weird. controlling. It's it's very strange to direct a play where neither of the characters feel comfortable in the space, and where the space actually belongs to somebody else. Um, because how you relate to the chair and the stuff in the refrigerator and drinking the water, like all that stuff. And I really feel like Kim, although that's a scary picture, um, even though um, <laughs> Kim is very real, I also feel like what Kim becomes and what she starts to represent is really sort of a, a sense of society. And I think where we end up with at the end of the play is a real sense of our characters in a kind of us against them, us mm -hmm. against Kim kind of way. And so there's a way in which the balance of figuring out who Kim was was also about figuring out how to make her as real as possible and then also give so that everybody who sees the set can say, um, I know that girl mm -hmm. and also um, have it still have a sense of humor and also feel real and not kind of um, super theatery um, and like that we're just like doing a bunch of stupid stuff just because we, it's like it's easy it actually mm -hmm. felt harder and more interesting to say what would what do people really do how do they organize their lives um, in ways so we spent a lot of time at the container store mm -hmm. and looking at um, <laughs> catalogs mm -hmm. at the container store yeah, who's Kim? Yeah. which one was she picked yeah. yeah and then actually we we spent a lot of time sort of Neil and I would look at things, the three of us would look at things, and then some of the choices that we made have actually made it into the script, um, and things that the um, characters talk about are actually things that either we had ideas about or the three of us had ideas about, and then Neil incorporated into the script itself. That's kind of... Yeah, there was a point, actually, where I, um, <clears throat> I asked about manifesting Kim slightly. I would talked to you about, should we put frames on the stage, you know, mm. a lot of like, because it would be mostly Kim, Kim yeah. kind of controls that that central area that, that you see throughout the, the play. And I thought even if the audience couldn't see him, it would be tantalizingly close to get a glimpse of her, you know, in, in, a, in a, a group of three or if it mm -hmm. was a single shot. Um, but that was something you were, you were actually against. I, I said it, no, it was really, yeah. 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 I was trying to say it in a nice way. Yeah, um, no, I was like, no. In which it didn't sound like I was, yeah, <laughs> side swipes. Um, like as if it was collaborative, um, <laughs> that fairy tale we mentioned earlier. Um, but it was a really smart no because, and I know the difference because I heard a lot of really bad no's in my childhood, um, not filled with thought and cleverness, just no. Um, but this one, you know, the idea that Kim remained quite universal and and everyone's version of Kim by not seeing her, personifying her in any way other than, than with that apartment, I thought was really smart. Oh. You know, at one point we actually were going to put artwork that would be Kim's artwork and we decided, actually it was the first day of tech that we decided Kim doesn't have art on display. It's too complicated for her. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then, but what we do see through the, actually the door to the right, we do get a glimpse of Beth's bedroom, which is an entirely different world. Mm -hmm. And in that we see a complete, Stuff. you know, a sense of disorder or actual human activity. And I'll just say about that, I'm sorry. No, no, no. no, I was just gonna say about that picture. That's actually a kind of um, moment of rebellion in the play. So you're actually not seeing, um, that's, that's a moment where everything's sort of in revolt. But you see a little bit of the- You can see all the boxes. Yeah, you can see the boxes kind of and some of Kim's stuff yeah. there, yeah. Um, all right, Lee, would you mind setting up for us the second excerpt? Do you know what Which it is? is this? You're asking this me? This is the kissing that turns into a um, Neil, will you set up the second excerpt? Um, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll set it up. Um, so and just anybody set it up. Sure, I'll set it up. Um, set it up. I'll set it up. So this is a moment where after there's been all kinds of like preamble and danger and tension and they finally start kissing and they're on the couch and it's really super sexy. And then this happens. Um, so, Neil. Yeah. Um, some of the controversy, um, behind a lot of your previous stuff is that it often deals with what uh, someone might refer to as a casual cruelty, the kind of things that people say to each other in regular conversation. Um, 
And I, it could be said, some people talk about your work as that you are simply sort of revealing and presenting truth about the world and sort of just delivering it, and other people see in your work um, more of a moral stance that you as the writer are taking. How, how would you respond to that um, as a writer? I would, I would probably position myself cleverly somewhere in the middle. That's right. You know, riding that fence <laughs> like the eagles before me. Reference to Desperado. <laughs> Look it up. Listen, enjoy. They need to sell some more albums, frankly. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a dangerous thing to go and, and make um, choices about characters, you know, to, to decide how you feel about them and, and, and judge them. Um, I think for actors, too. I think, you know, that is... The audience is always that important other side of the triangle or square or however, whatever geometric figure that you don't <laughs> you remember <laughs> from school, they are that other side of that. And they come in and, and you know, we, I think at our best, we raise questions for people. Um, I don't know that we have the power. It's a powerful place, the stage, I think. I don't know that we, we change people's minds in 90 minutes. I don't know that we, you know, change the world in 90 minutes, but I think we ask and it's a place that we is is prime to continue to ask questions um, that need to be asked, and often, like with asking questions, not questions that I necessarily think that I know the answer to. Mm -hmm. Thus, the asking of them throughout the course of a a piece of work, and so then theme starts to emerge and all that. I'm not a very thematic writer. I tend not to write, you know, starting with theme. I can start in a lot of places, but I don't necessarily start there. Happily, themes you know emerge occasionally, um, sometimes more than one, and and great. Um, that may suddenly make you seem as if you know that's what you're talking about, and that's what you're you know shaking your fist in the air about. Um, but for me, it's it's more about the exploration of character and and situation um, and being a good storyteller. You know that, that you're always remembering that you're you are there to to take an audience on a ride, to tell them something, even perhaps a, something as simple as a boy meets girl story um, in as new a way and as new a version as, as possible for you to do. Um, so again, I think that, that my job is to do that, to provide that kind of entertainment, to ask those questions, but not really to, to uh, always take a, a stance about something. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, and those things can happen, right? If you write about anything that's that's interesting or or could be controversial, or or you can just you know create a moment. It's 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 a strange thing to make a connection with an audience, and 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 very lucky in a day like or an age like like now where there's so much possible entertainment and and um, and product out there for an audience to 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 um, have any kind of sphere of influence that lasts beyond their dinner, you know, mm -hmm. following uh, their show. Um, and when they move on to something else or, you know, um, they're reading a book and watching three television shows and living their life, uh, to think that something you do might continue to make them think about it or question mm -hmm. an idea in it is a great thing. I, I think that's a, that's a terrific and amazing thing when it happens, but I don't think it's always like the end game. Mm -hmm. In the end, I think we still find ourselves entertainers and storytellers and, and that, um, somehow that Brechtian mix of, of teach and entertain, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully intertwines and creates something that, um, that is, is, is worth the dough that you spend. And, and often it's a lot of dough. Mm -hmm. um, dough meaning money. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Catchphrase my father used to like to use. Um, so uh, I, I just think, you know, that is, that's the exchange that we, we are supposed to make as as, uh, as people doing this, this job. And, um, and that's sort of where I come from, rather than, than getting too lofty and you know, thinking that, that uh, there's a huge importance to this. I think it's important because um, the sort of nature of it. I, you know, I, I, it's one thing I think about theater is that it's, it's quite unique into itself, and I don't think it will probably ever go away because of how unique it is an experience for people when they experience it, um, so unlike television and film and, and even other performing arts. Um, so I think it is one that will continue to last and it's a, 
I, I don't, it's a kind of intangible why it's so terrific, but I think that those who love it know why they love it. And, uh, and on both sides of it, I, I go to it because I, I, you know, I go to it more often than I, than I do it. And I, do, I go to it because I love it. And I love to watch it and be in there when the curtain goes up and the lights go down and, and uh, still go to the movies because I appreciate that, you know, the sanctity of the space and, mm -hmm. and uh, what I've gathered along the way from all those experiences. When, when do you first show anyone something that you've written? Hmm. Is there, does that change? It, it changes from time to time. Um, Has it changed also throughout your career as well? Did, is, have you found now that I actually have anybody who's interested, <laughs> uh, for the first ten years, no one cared. You know, so um, <laughs> I would show it to people just on the street. <laughs> right. they, what know, do you think of this? You know, like, <laughs> show it to every theater company in America, who promptly would reject it. And um, um, so, you know, I like like so many people was one of those you know, fifteen years in the making overnight successes. And, um, and so um, now it's, it's really uh, a group of people, there are, there are all kinds of, of people in that group, but people you, know, you just come to trust, that you want that, and you're, you're the first audience yourself as you write something, and then you want to put that in front of a, a set of eyes that you've, you've trusted in the past in something. Um, I've sent stuff to you, you know. Um, I don't think I got, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm sure it never got to a you. A different email, yeah. I think, that um, uh, you know, Tommy was one of the first people to read this play. Um, you know, I think it's it's important to um, to have people that you know you really love, trust, and and um, because they're the ones who will who will be really um, truthful and honest and 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 harsh when they need to be. Uh, I've got friends who will sometimes ask me, "Will you read something?" Mm -hmm. And I can I can get that little shimmer of what you really want is a hug, and you want me to tell you it's good. <laughs> And I'll, I mean, I can do that without looking, reading it, frankly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just need yeah. a hug. It's great. Come on yeah. over. I'll give you one. <laughs> but, you know, you really have to ask them, do you, do you really want to know what I think? You know, and, and um, because someone eventually is going to tell you, and someone's going to tell you in print, and they're going to tell you after you really can't do anything about it. Right. So it, there's a point where it's like we, we get to protect ourselves in an interesting process here from beginning to end. You know, it's a process that I understand. Having made a few movies, I still don't really understand why they make them the way they do. I mean, I do, I know it's economics. It's all about, you know, money. It's all dough, if you will. Um, it's all about that, and, um, and, I, and I get why they, they do it, because it is also a business, but um, I much prefer the, you know, the process that we go through. But um, it's a silly one to really try and hide. You know, it's, it's uh, I think good directors, good writers, good everybody uh, aren't afraid of someone walking in. I didn't find you ever afraid of someone walking in the rehearsal room and seeing what we're doing. You know, you want the actors to feel like in on it as well, mm -hmm. like it's okay. But um, there's nothing to hide. There's nothing mm -hmm. to hide behind. You're, you're headed like a freight train toward hundreds of people seeing it all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now in this age, saying exactly what they think about it from your very first preview. Mm -hmm. There's no more of this kind of, you know, um, we'll wait until it opens. Right. Re reviewers may do that, but, but everyone else is, it's Social fair game. Yeah. yeah, so it's, um, there's, to reach out and say, L let me hear what you think, you know, uh, it's just, it's part of the game for me. Rewriting is, is part of the process. I, again, many writers I know who don't like to rewrite, and I don't really understand what that is, mm -hmm. because it, to me it's, I, it's never come out as, as spun gold. You know, it's never had the full Rumpelstiltskin experience. Um, you know, it's always, well, this is good. And, and at, at its best, after, you know, 15 workshops and however many versions, you hand it over to this person and they go, good, good place to start. You know, and, and, and but you look at my stage directions and you go, now this is going to be, you know, between us, a version of that. Um, what you see, will go see on stage here is not exactly what's written on the page, and, and, and thank God for that. That was just one idea, you know. Um, so that's, I, I think it's, it's great to, uh, to get, get it out to people early, the, the, but, but to ones that you trust. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I don't, whoever can set up the next scene, I don't know who wants to take it. Neil? Uh, I think no? I'll do it. Yeah, you, you, you got it? <laughs> you got it? Uh, no, but I'll do a song. Uh, quick, um, 16 bars, so yeah, whatever this, you got. I'll just do cats in the uh. frame quickly. Um, this, this next scene is deeper in the play, 
um, it's um, it's getting toward toward the end of the play um, when when I guess what you described as uh, this game of chicken has evolved into finally someone kind of spilling their heart and saying this is this is where I see that we could go um, if we take the chance and uh, and uh, that's that's Doug and and Beth really who has, has been hedging, they've both been hedging in, in various ways about what's the pros and cons of, of starting a relationship together. Um, and we really kind of at this point learn um, all of, of about the insecurities that Beth is dealing with in her life in terms of the, the kinds of relationships she's had and the place that she finds herself um, this morning after this, uh, this wedding uh, vow renewal. Um, I think as we saw in that last one where that ended up, um, Lee, I think uh, some people might say that um, this play occupies some of the uh, territory of more, Neil's more romantic works. Um, do you feel like there are any specific challenges or opportunities uh, there given people's expectations, possibly, of walking into a Neil LeBute production? Well, I, I keep feeling like right up that sort of my job as the director right up until the very end is to keep us even after this, some more things happen, right? So it's kind of like my job is to keep the ball in the air about can these two people be brave enough, decide, should they, do we want them to? All these questions stay very buoyant right till the very last second that there's a chance that one of them is going to freak out and it's not going to happen because it's that's kind of the way the play is crafted and it requires attention um and so i feel like um partly that job is done for me because it's a neil abute play so i think at every moment people are like oh he's gonna kill her <laughs> um <laughs> And uh, so I have that going for me because um, people are just like, oh God, you know, every time someone moves, they're like, <gasps> um, but it's, um, I, I do think that this is, at least in my- No spoilers though. No we spoilers, don't, we don't, yeah. Anything could still happen. Anything could happen. Um, that could still happen. It could still happen. I feel like um, it is also true that of Neil's plays, I feel like this play is um, incredibly, incredibly romantic and, um, so hopeful and um, I've had people say to me um, we've just tonight actually right now is our last preview of our first week um, and uh, people have said to me like they've they never expected to be so moved in a Neil Butte play and I, um, since, I since reasons to be pretty since reasons to be pretty they haven't been so moved since reasons to be pretty. exactly <laughs> differently moved I think that was, full, that was the full that quote. Was the full that quote. was the full yeah. quote, yeah. Um, differently. Mm -hmm. um, and I Carry think on. that there's something that is, um, for me, really exciting about um, uh, what, what people's expectations are of a Neil Butte play and then what they encounter when they encounter this play. And, um, and they feel different and strange and exciting. And not to get, again, into too much spoiler territory, but there are a lot of other surprises, as you have said. Um, how, how has it been this week, kind of seeing it in front of an audience? Um, and ha have, have, can you talk about that without uh, revealing any secrets? Um, yeah, it's been, really, it's been really exciting. We've been doing a lot of work, you know, during previews, we do a lot of work during the day, and then we try stuff at night in front of an audience, and then we go back in the next day and do a lot of work during the day, and then try new things at night. And so Neil's been rewriting, and I've been restaging, and you haven't done very much. But, you know, it's been mostly very, um, <laughs> Uh, we have some new props, that's not yeah. true. <laughs> um, we, we've been really, and, and I will just use this opportunity to actually say that is why um, actors who are good at working on new work, who care about new work, who care about the process, people like Marin Ireland, who um, Neil and I have both been work, lucky enough to work with, um, Marin and I have done two new plays together, and um, you, the best thing that can happen for a creative team in a moment like this when you're in previews and you're throwing a lot of new stuff at them is to have actors who are like, great, what else? And um, it's not every actor who can do that, and I feel so lucky to have um, made two plays with Marin, and um, I, I feel like um, it's a really interesting moment for actors because they're, um, th 
not exactly sure what's going to happen and night to night. There might be something, I don't know if, if a lot of people here know what happens during previews is that frequently you show up at two o'clock or something in the afternoon and you're handed um, like a new monologue or this year's a rewrite to the scene and you're going to put, you spend a couple hours rehearsing it and then maybe over dinner you memorize it and then you try and do it that night. Um, so it is a particular kind of a, a challenge is what Lee is referring to is putting the rewrites and every so often they'll be like, do you want to wait till tomorrow and try this? But by then you've already been rehearsing it for an hour and then your mind is sort of scrambled eggs. So you feel like, let's just see what happens tonight. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a particular thing about working on new plays that in case yeah. people don't know and exactly not, that. And not every actor is so um, excited about that process. And um, Marina certainly one and Tommy and Amanda have also been um, completely into that. And what's been really exciting too is that Tommy um, is a, has done a, a million plays. He's um, was in Reasons to be Pretty, obviously, other desert cities. He's just a consummate theater professional, and this is Amanda's first play. And so the two of them together, it's been really, really interesting because um, Amanda's entire career has been in movies and on television. And so it's been so exciting to watch her figure it out every night and to learn from Tommy and from the exp this experience. I mean, it's, it's a great exciting joy to watch someone be like, oh, theater, I get it. <laughs> and the first day it was like, oh God. And then it's like, oh yeah, you know, and um, when I saw the matinee today and she was like, I'm having fun. And I was like, great. We're, she's like, I'm never doing theater, you know, movies again, it's theater all the time. And I was like, got another one, <laughs> done. So, um, so they're, they're really terrific. Um, well, I think on, on, that, on that note, um, I think we, we're, we'll, kind of wrap up um, before the, the final excerpt. Um, so I would like to thank Caroline and Mary Sharp Cronson for inviting Second Stage to be part of this series and also Jonathan Witten at Second Stage, Duke Dang at Works in Process and everyone here at the Guggenheim for their help and preparation. Um, performances are currently on sale for the way we get by through June 14th and inside your programs this evening there is a special ticket discount flyer for works and process attendees. Uh, I know I see for everyone up here um, when I say I hope to see you at the theater. Um, thank you again to you wonderful, extraordinary, talented individuals. Thank you, Marin. And to our actors. And um, our final excerpt, uh, anyone take it away? Uh, you set it up. Okay. Um, this is... Uh, our fourth excerpt, but actually not as deep in the play as what you uh, saw just previous. Um, this is another kind of crossroads where um, Doug, as I described earlier, kind of does pour his heart out and, and says, um, senses though that um, things may not go in their favor, his favor, um, and that this evening may have been the only time that they'll ever spend together. Um, and, uh, and what you hear is him bemoaning that because he wishes that, uh, that things could end differently. <laughs> 